It's Friday. It's nighttime. There's a chill in the air. We're approaching the gym. The lights are on. We get inside the buzz of the crowd, right? It's game night, Friday night basketball, and we want to be our best. One of the ways we do that is we get better as basketball officials by looking at plays and all of the things. That's what we're going to do today. Stick around. Greetings. Welcome back. Five Play Friday. Appreciate you joining. My name is Greg Austin with The Better Official. We craft video to help basketball officials get better and take control of their officiating career. One of the ways we do that is we look at plays. We look at all of the things. We start today's show with a You Make the Call play. What do you have on this play? All right, what do you have on this play? This crew appears to have ruled a shooting foul on this play. Would you have something different? Make your ruling, put it in the comments, and stick around to the end of the video. We have lots to say about this play. There's a lot of things we need to be aware of on this play. So stick around to the end of the video, and we will look at all of the things on play number one. But with that, let's move on to play number two. Offensive basket interference is ruled on this play. What about the subsequent contact on the play? Did we have a correct ruling? Let's look at all of the things. All right, we have a steal. Our lead does a great job of getting a look. I think we have to accelerate a little bit there. No foul on the play. Player goes up, grabs the net while the ball is on the ring, even though the ball would have gone in. And then we have subsequent displacement on a player who is entitled to their spot on the floor and was displaced on this play. Let's think about all of the things. On this play. So we know that it is a basket interference violation by either team to contact the basket while the ball is on or in the basket. On the basket would be on the ring or on the flange. In the basket would be the ball in the basket, which includes the flange, the ring, and the net. Okay, so it appears, if we look,
That ball is on the ring when the when the, the net is contacted. That is a basket interference violation by rule. But what about the contact? What do we have there? All right. Understanding when the ball becomes dead is critical to the equation here. Does the ball become dead in this situation on the official's whistle? Or does the ball become dead on the act itself? Hmm, that's a good puzzler. If the ball is dead, this subsequent contact is to be ignored, ruled intentional dead ball contact or flagrant dead ball contact. Those are our three options. What exists as a common foul during a dead ball may be ignored by the officials on the play here. If that ball became dead, the subsequent di displacement, we have to evaluate whether that was intentional or flagrant, which I don't believe that it was. So our officials got this play correct. That's a good play just to review, look at all of the things so we can get better as basketball officials. So when we take to the court for that big Friday night game, we're at our best. Coming together and working as a crew is critical, as it would be on this play, if uh, one of our officials put a whistle on the play for the foul. And uh, one of the things we have on the show here is we have a great crew effort. And I'd like to thank our tremendous show supporters who help fuel our broadcast. Tom Hickey, Mo Klotz, Herb Hahn, Darwin Sonata, and Mark Skolnick. Much appreciated. Much love. You want to support the show? You can put a link. I will put a link, rather, down on in the show notes below. The first pinned comment, and I will always put one here right above the Christmas tree. Tremendous. Awesome. With that, let's move on to our very next play. All right, we have a uh, missed foul in transition, a resulting player standing over an opponent. What do we have on this play? Let's look at all of the things, right? So our, our player uh, in white here uh, looks to have stolen the basketball and is going the other way. Was there a change of possession, though? Um, and is pushed, and our crew misses that. And then subsequently, another player stands over a player um, to the, the player on the floor attempts to get up and is unable to, pushes the player who is above. All right, so we have green in team control. They are in the front court. The ball is deflected from behind by the player in white. Uh, teammate from white attempts to get the basketball, is, seems to be pushed in the, uh, to the floor in this situation. This would be a team control foul as there was no change of possession prior, and we always want to identify team control fouls, but neither our new lead or our old trail, right, has a, a stack look on the play, would have to make a guess. Our old lead does not put a whistle on the play. Player goes to the floor, a scrum, all loose, and we are left with this predicament, where green four is standing over his opponent, making no attempt to get away from this situation. Uh, many, many individuals, human beings, feel this is a very offensive action, especially between male players. Player attempts to get up, and a foul is ruled on green. 
blocking foul. Our officials are a little unclear. They, sh they show uncertainty about what's going to happen next. The fact that this was a team control foul was not uh, reflected on the, in the reporting of the official as well. Yeah, so the question would rise, um, is this a common foul? Is this something before the foul? Is this a technical foul for unsporting action by Green for standing over their opponent in this fashion? A case could certainly be made for that. Um, we may have some explaining to do if that's the case, but the case could certainly be made, right? This player made no effort to remove themselves from the situation after they were standing over. Uh, who knows what the temperature in the game was leading up to that point between these two players. Um, but ultimately, a common foul, a team control foul is ruled. Ball is going to be inbounded in the backcourt. And when we go down to the other end, the other coach says, hey, you missed that push on that, uh, on that steal. And we don't want to miss that. Obviously, a competitive game, second period. So an unusual play, an interesting play, not a play that we see every day. Something to think about, be aware of. We lose track a little bit of what's going on between those players because the ball goes away. Tough in two-person to get all these plays right, but a play that's helpful to look at so that we can put that in our memory bank when we have something similar in our game. Hey, that play was submitted by Rick from Montana. If you want to submit a play, there'll be a link in the show description. I'll put it in the first pinned comment. And what am I? Where? Christmas tree, baby. Christmas tree. I'll put it up above. All right, let's move on. Next play. All right, dead ball technical ruled in this situation. Let's take a look. Player goes to the basket, shoots and scores. Seems to go find his opponent, uh, create contact, pinching him against the wall. Possibly some language uh, exchanged in the scenario. Oftentimes, this kind of play is sometimes unofficiated, but not in this instance. Our center stays with the play. Who knows the temperature of the game, etc. Let's take a look. Number two, right, with, with a body posture that suggests an unsporting uh, communication to their opponent after scoring on them on this drive. The officials assess a player technical foul for either the dead ball contact, something that was said, a taunt that was said, or a combination of the two. And then we have a, our offended coach. What? Out to approximately the three-point line, volleyball line, to express confusion on the play. This is not acceptable. Um, should uh, be dealt with in the appropriate fashion. Either um, certainly a comment to coach, I need you in your box right away by our non-calling official. Um, but a great job here of our center official staying with the play not letting this be unofficiated action. If, you know, they, just the contact in and of itself, seeking out the opponent, right? And especially depending on what has occurred in our game previously, this is a great get. One that can lead to confusion, like what happened, right? But we, we cannot allow our coaches to stray out on the court and dis, uh, they are expressing a disagreement in this fashion, this and they are not allowed to do that. It's as simple as that, right? It's a point of emphasis this year. It needs to be addressed on a play such as this, but a great job of our crew here of not allowing this to be unofficiated action. 
we do see that on occasion on plays such as this. Hey, if this is the video content you find valuable, it'd be a great time to do all the things. If you hit that like button, it really helps us with the YouTube algorithm, gets the video in front of more basketball officials so we can all get better together. Fantastic. Hey, let's look at our next play. So far here today, overall in the season coming into this game, she was 26 of 55 for a 47% free throw percentage, which is not too bad. Team leading by three, however, 11 to eight is the score. Some more fans checking into the game as it's progressing. Game starting here early afternoon time, so a lot of family members and parents probably still trying to make their way home from commutes. I don't imagine the crowd to be this sparse for the boys' game, but then nighttime it settled in. And it's going to be packed house here at Lady College. Yeah, it helps when it's a little couple hours later, and uh, should be a fun one, too. Box stops with a minute 20 seconds as another foul goes against the Bulldogs. That's their 15th foul here, compared to 16 fouls against Wildcats. Not to get caught up on who are the recipients of those fouls after the first quarter break. Yeah, the Wildcats have been able to do it. All right, the rare substitute technical foul ruled in this situation during a live ball. A substitute hears a horn, runs onto the floor. We have six on the floor, live ball situation. Um, the center official rules this to be a substitute technical foul. Now, something unusual has happened in our game. Are we sure what has happened in this situation, right? So our center official goes to the trail official, confirming you did not beckon that player onto the court. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, that's correct. Then in this situation, it's a playoff game, in this situation, a, a substitute technical foul is warranted. The horn sounded. When the horn sounds, that does not give players permission, even if it sounded erroneously, for players to run onto the court. They have the responsibility for their actions. We had the ball in a live ball situation here where we cannot ignore this activity, right? Once we confirm, make sure we have everything, all our ducks in a row, we assess the tactical foul, and the game moves on. It's relatively simple and straightforward. Just wanted to include this into uh, the show today because it's an unusual situation, right? Had the ball not been live in this situation, then we can potentially, you know, sort of game manage. Uh, the, uh, hey, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait till you're a hey coach. Wait till we beckon the players, et cetera. Right. But this is a substitute tactical foul by ruled, properly ruled by our calling officials. Now, uh, calling official. Now, if we look at the original held ball situation, there's a little something to take out of this as well. Let's take a look at habits and fundamentals of our lead official on this play. Right, this is a great approach here. Right, we've got something, we got ball is loose, players here. Boom, comes in. He is focused on the players in this situation. This is a relatively volatile situation. Players can, you know, throw elbows, we can have dive ons, we can have all sorts of things. Our complete attention here needs to be by our lead official on this action on the floor, right? Our center official is free in this situation to glance and get the information about the direction of the arrow. And our lead official can simply look up and our, tr our center official will have that information. If we think about it, it's almost like a mirror. They are looking through the center official to see the information at the table. So often in this situation, we see officials turn their head with those players on the floor 
right? Use your crew and work as a crew in these situations to get plays right. So that's a great habit and fundamental that jumps off by our lead official on this play. And that's what we're all about here on this show is finding habits and fundamentals that we can bring to our game, identifying weaknesses we may have, identifying strengths, identifying how we want to display the correct habits and fundamentals on the court. Another point that we have on this play is what happens to the arrow on this play. We have an alternating possession throw-in. A technical foul occurs during the throw-in. We are going to administer two free throws. We are going to have the ball for a throw-in at the division line opposite the table uh, to White. And what happens to the arrow in this situation? When does the arrow change? That's something we'd like to know. I'll tell you what, I have exciting news. I've created a course, a throw-in course, that gives us all the things we need to know about throw-ins. And I will put a link down in the show note, and I'll put a link up above so we can get these plays right. In this situation, the throw-in ends in one of three fashions, and this throw-in did not end. Therefore, the arrow is not switched in this situation. Hey, back at the start of the show, we had play number one, a you-make-the-call play. Let's review play number one. All right, this is quite a play, right? Very deft action by our ball handler here behind the back move. That is so sweet. Goes, and the player does a slide tackle. Wait a minute, the soccer game is outside. Ay, ay, ay. The soccer match is outside. Right. This is a very dangerous play and one that needs to be penalized. National Federation of High School does not want rough play in the game. They are very concerned with concussions, rough play, injury, etc. Our job is to prevent injury as much as possible. We can't prevent this play, but we can penalize it. This is, at minimum, an intentional foul. And in my opinion, this is a flagrant act. This is a player who dives recklessly towards an airborne player's legs with the express purpose of taking them out. This player crashes hard to the floor, slams into the wall, head and neck area, etc. This is not part of the game of basketball and should be penalized. We see the behavior of our, our miscreant here as well, right? They see that, oh, that guy's hurt, right? And then he comes up, oh, I'm hurt too. I don't believe you. I just don't believe you. Right, and we're looking all at all of the things on a play like this. What's the other thing that we have in this play? We have a crew dynamic of extremely veteran official who's probably in charge. Do we 
Do we have the ability to come express what we feel we need to do on this play? Or is it just like, well, the play was your call. It's your call to make. Um, whatever you say goes, etc. Or do we need to stand up for the game and say, this is what I have on this play? Sometimes, as officials, we have to stand in front of the game. And, and express ourselves, right? We don't want to say, we don't want to get back to the locker room on this play and say, wow, I thought that was a flagrant foul and, and that you were going to rule that, but you didn't. And so, right, we need to express ourselves, fight for the, what we feel is right in the game. And that's what we should have on this play. When you have the dynamic of an extremely veteran official and an extremely young new official, are we going to be able to do that? Do we have that comfortability to do that? So, that comes out in this play. Another thing that comes out in this play is let's be aware of what's going on with our injured player, right? This is at the end of the game. This is only three minutes remaining in the game. Let's take a look. It's a three possession game, right? With three minutes remaining. Now, you know that number one, who exhibits the great ball handling skills, is probably one of their better players. Is there a chance that he's going to return to the game, right? Well, there's not a chance that he's going to return the game if we observe the behavior exhibited, right? So we are aware that this player slammed into the wall with their head and neck area. We're aware of that, okay? We're concerned for their um, uh, safety, et cetera, right? When they stumble like that, they have exhibited signs of a possible concussion. And in order for that player to, re to return to the game, we would need somebody on the medical side of things to approve that return. They, because Not because they hit the, hit the wall hard. That's fine. That doesn't mean that they cannot return. But if they exhibit signs of a concussion, they cannot return to the game without clearance by a medical professional. You, this may be different in your part of the state or, or part of the country, but we have to be aware of these things on this play. If we look at the play itself, to me, it's obvious this player made no play on the ball, slid in a very reckless fashion into the legs of the player. This is a flagrant act, intent to harm, and they succeeded. And this play acting after the fact does not alleviate that responsibility. So that's my view of this play. There's just no place in the game for this activity. And when we, it, ex, it exists in our game, we must penalize accordingly. That would be a great takeaway from this play. Yeah, right. Oftentimes, if, if, if I think, well, wait a minute, there's at least upgrade is on the table for any reason whatsoever, not on this play. For this play, it's a, upgrade is obviously on the table, but we can gather information from our crew and say, what did you have? What did you have? What did you have? Right. And so and, and work together. There's no there's none of that dynamic. Neither of the two non-calling officials wants to provide any information. Do they feel that they can? Right. That's what we want to always have on our crew is permission from everybody to respond to their internal clock, internal voice that's saying, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. We need to talk about this play. Hey, we got a bonus play. Let's take a look. Second free throw for Brown. Back rim, no good. And Muse trying to fight for the board was arm locked with a couple of Carondelet players. Dwiggins came up with it, but then a foul is called on Carondelet. Officials discussing it. Maybe some clarity on who it's on or what type of foul it is. Well, Coach O'Connell uses opportunity to chat with Sweeney a bit. Yep, offensive foul was the call on Howie. Yeah, I think they were just trying to figure if it was offensive foul or loose ball or, yeah. or, or what variety of call. Uh, because they called it an offensive foul, now they're not shooting free throws. Yeah. 
Uh, so it kind of works in Crondelette's favor. A little bit. Oh, although I don't know if it's offensive foul because she really was kind of ball was in the air a little yeah. bit. I don't I, I, All right, so we have what appears to be a missed foul on white and then a subsequent foul on white that the center official is ruling. We are shooting bonus free throws, identifies our shooter, wants to go the other way. And this is very common in this situation. We always have to recognize team control fouls for what they are. My recommendation, of course, is to always rule team control fouls as team control fouls. Early in the game, first foul of the game, team control foul is similar to this. Rule it a team, learn to identify these situations, right? And then work as a crew to prevent awarding unmerited free throws as would have occurred in this situation, right? The calling official report uh, indicates the foul, indicates the shooter, and the game just says, let's go, right? Sometimes as officials, we have to stand in front of the game and say, we are about to make a mistake by rule. Let's not make that mistake. Use declarative statements. That was a team control foul, no free throws, right? There had been no change of possession. That's a team control foul, right? To, in order to and we come together as a crew, we see at the end our, our uh, old lead, new trail, you know, uh, a nod of a head, et cetera. That's what we want coming out of those conversations is agreement by the crew as to how we will handle, how we will proceed. We also see, of course, that uh, the knowledge base of uh, people commenting on the game who are actually instructing fans about what to expect in the game is not always uh, rules-based, right? They have a job to do. Sometimes they provide erroneous information, um, but that is just a fact of life for basketball officials. And a factor of life for a better official is we have tremendous show supporters, and I'd like to thank them right now. Tom Hickey, Mo Klotz, Herb Hahn, Darwin Sonata, and Mark Skolnick. Much appreciated. Much love. You want to support the show and buy us a coffee? I will make sure there's a link in the show notes. I will put it in the first pinned comment. And again, I'll put it under the Christmas tree here. And I appreciate your support. Well, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. I have an additional video for you here. I have a link that you can check out for that throw-in course that I suggested. And we'll see you in the very next video. Take care, everybody.